micro. Okay, and um, so we have a timer here. Well, I'm sorry I don't have two screens and so on, but uh, they see it. Yep. <laughs> and let's go. Oh. Okay. Oh, four minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. So everyone, uh, so I don't have a lot of time, but uh, I wanted to talk to you about a new tool that I did uh, a few weeks back. Uh, I was actually doing some behavioral analysis and I uh, was using ProcDot to analyze my ProcMon files export in CSV and I thought it was uh, needed some performance issues and etc. And uh, I wanted to learn Rust, so I coded a tool uh, which uh, uses Story, which is a cross-platform uh, desktop application building tool with uh, Rust in the backend and uh, JavaScript or any framework you run in the front end. So it's cross-platform. And the goal is to export your Procmon data that can be millions of lines if you want. And when you have run your malware sample and just recorded the activities with Procmon, uh, you can just export this uh, in CSV and imported it into uh, Vision Procman. So um, I will just give you a quick demo and uh, let's go. Okay, so um, the way that it works once you fire up the application is that you just give the full path of uh, the CSV and then you just click on load. And this is approximately one million lines, and you see that because it's trust, it's going quickly. And um, so uh, I have taken a sample of one of the latest Qbout uh, malware campaign that is using OneNot uh, malicious files. And so I will analyze this process now. So you can see these visualization tools propose to you a few things. And we can see that the OneNot process uh, started the mshta.exe, uh, which started two other process, uh, a curl.exe and then uh, the run32.dll. So uh, if you click on the registry key creation, you are going to be able to visualize all the registry key created. We can see this file is, uh, this registry key is very uh, suspicious. So we can see if there is any uh, set values uh, for this registry key. And uh, we see that there is one. And you can see the details here. So it's actually some data obfuscated uh, to execute a JavaScript. And then you can see the registry key deletion, deleted values, and do some correlations. You can see the steps here. So you can see there is a registry key creation here, then is deleted later. If we click on, for example, curl.exe, we see that curl is used to fetch a fake PNG file and then being um, and executed later using run uh, 32DL. <laughs> and I have no time, so thank you. Hi, thanks for sticking around and listening to lightning talks. So I'm going to talk about desktop group again. Um, this is who I am. So I've been working for at SwissPost for almost 16 years in a couple months. And I uh, also added uh, our team's Twitter handle to the slide. So um, I've been a regular speaker here. I've given uh, five presentations and this is my fourth lightning talk. The last couple were about desktop group as well. So that first presentation was in 2019. And here a little bit history about desktop group. We started tracking them over five years ago in early 2018. And uh, just in November last year, uh, Group IB published a report uh, after some collaboration 
uh, and they were holding it back for over a year. So finally it's out. And I updated my blog post to include a download link where you can get the PDF report without having to give, a, to give out your email address or your details. So you can just go to my blog and download the PDF, look at the blog uh, they wrote and the webinar. I also added some aliases for this group as well. Uh, I haven't added the blue bottle from a Simon Tech blog uh, from earlier this year. But that's another alias uh, that's very likely related to this group. Um, the report has some nice uh, overview about how the organization and the attacks work. Uh, they're using VPN, spear phishing, and uh, mule, mule accounts to cash out the money. Um, there are some nice key findings as well. Um, they've done uh, more than 30 attacks. They stole more than 30 million money in 15 countries. Uh, they're likely originated uh, from a French-speaking country in Africa. And most of their attacks have been to French-speaking countries in different continents. So here, the takeaway or the recipe, how I did it. Um, so aggressively block all email attachments that could be malicious. And then also do malware analysis on those samples from quarantined emails. Uh, track malware families and C2 infrastructure. Correlate, uh, look at targeting at email headers as well. Uh, share and collaborate. I created my own research group. There's about seven people here at this conference. And find and name your own threat groups that matter most to you. And who all is doing this? Raise your hand. Who all is doing this? Just a few. Well, here's the recipe. So go ahead, start doing that. Hello. So one IP address has two country locations. So it's about geolocation of IP addresses. So what is ONIF? It's a cyber defense search engine. We are specialized in attack surface discovery and attack surface management. We collect many kinds of data. For instance, we collect who is data, which is uh, the subject of this Lightning talk. I've read an article about the recertification of Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian IP registration. Basically, beginning March 2014, when Russia started to invade some countries, they updated with records to remove the UA and replace it with RU. And this can be found in uh, historical who is records. So the ID here is an IP address, maybe physically in a country, but logically registered somewhere else. Oh. So it's important to, to keep track of the lo uh, logical geolocation. You can do that with the records. And you have to keep track also of the physical geolocation. You can obtain with trace routing, basically by uh, searching the last hop and identifying where the last hop is. So both can be useful. And until today, there, was, there, there is no geolocation database where you have access to both information. So we created a geolocation database. IP Info, which is a great provider of geolocation, decided to make available for free the link between a, a network block and a physical country. So we correlate, correlate that with who is data. So we can build a geolocation database with WIS data and add just the physical information in the generated file. And for instance, in the article, there are some uh, network blocks attributed to Ukraine. And if we use the database, we clearly see for these ranges, they are from WIS records in Russia, but physically in Ukraine. So Geolocus is uh, an IP to two country geolocation database. You have access to physical and logical locations. 
And you decide, basically, what is needed for your use case. Sometimes you will prefer the logical one, sometimes the physical one. You decide. It's a side project from ONIF. Of course, it will be integrated in uh, ONIF data. And it's completely free. There is even no license. You can connect on geolocus.io, download the M MMDB file, or use the, IP the API without registering at all. Thanks. Hello everyone. Uh, first, I wanted to fix something. We talk about Mimi cats. We talk about Mimisha, and we have seen no pictures of cat already. So, this is fixed. Uh, so, I'm Eric Leblanc. I'm a founder of uh, Stamus Networks, and I'm working on Suricata. And I'm a lazy guy because I'm French. Uh, so, um, we talk about this morning about Yara on Suricata on, on signatures of Yara, and you got the same with Suricata. You need to do detection, but it's not easy, as this guy state. Um, it's a bit complicated because it comes from the snort age, so 2000 and something. So the syntax is obscure and complex. And uh, yes, and you need to have performances because we are talking about probe that can be 10 gig or uh, even 100 gig. So you need to be fast, a bit like with Yara, you need to have performance. Uh, so writing signature can be a nightmare. Uh, you need to check the syntax, syntax is not easy, then you need to check the performance, so that's really a problem. Okay, so I'm lazy, as I said, so I had to automate uh, this. Uh, so I did develop a language server that is using, that can be used, a language server protocol is a standard developed by Microsoft that allow uh, a text editor, an IDE, to discuss with a backend that know about a language. Uh, so it's really open. There is one existing for Yara. I did not test it, but it exists. So with a Suricata language server, what you can do is to have syntax checking when you have writing rule, and you got auto completion, and you've got also rule optimization on performance int, so you know that the rule you are writing are efficient. And this is done by, uh, by asking Suricata about the, um, the fact that the rules are correct or not. And it has been tested with uh, Visual Studio, NeoVim, Kate, for example. Up. Here it's for uh, Visual Studio code output, so you can see uh, different alerts, uh, different uh, syntax error, and some hint about the performance. And it also works on NeoVim. Here we show the completion, so you start to type uh, a keyword, and then you get the completion and the access to the documentation, so you can directly access to the doc. That's quite convenient. And uh, yeah, so if you want more information about this, uh, you can just uh, download it from uh, GitHub. Uh, there is a Visual Studio Code plugin. And um, I've also done a webinar explaining everything. But if you want to read about this, you can also uh, use the Suricata for Analyse book I've wrote with Peter Maneff that explain all the errors that you can have in the Suricata language server. So you, it will help you to write uh, performant uh, Suricata uh, rules. So don't hesitate if you have to contact me and I will be there at the social on tomorrow. Um, and have a nice gala. Hi everybody. My name is uh, Jean Marceau, and today I will talk about uh, Microsoft Graph API and uh, how to use it to hide in play sites. So uh, the context, I work for a French commercial cert, um, and uh, three weeks ago, I started an incident response. Um, the initial intrusion was performed using an unpatched appliance exposed on the internet. And one week later, uh, the access was sold again to uh, another group that performed the Prevesc, and the Prevesc was done fully in five hours. Uh, hopefully, our client caught uh, the attacker during its lateralization and its establishment of persistence. And for once, since the attack was really short in time, we had full visibility. So let's focus on things that we saw that were quite interesting. Uh, we saw a user on rootkit on the initial uh, patient. And then uh, we saw a custom beacon uh, that was quite funny to uh, look at. So. 
um, if you're a red team attacker, um, basically uh, you're tired of having your IP address or your domain blocked. So how can you improve? You can use Microsoft Graph API. For those who don't know the Graph API, it's a way of providing access to lots of Microsoft services. And it's uh, really hard to block because everything in uh, the Windows environment uses it. Uh, sometimes it's even whitelisted in proxies, so uh, it's nice to use for C2 communication. And this is what we observed. We observed the malware. Uh, the threat actor created a malicious Azure tenant. Uh, he used the Outlook and OneDrive subscriptions in the tenant uh, as a dead drop for uh, commands and uh, outputs. So uh, the infected hosts were discuss discussing with the malicious tenants through the Graph API, and uh, we were kind of hopeless because it was impossible to block. So at that point, we had to look for something else, and uh, we discovered, some of you may know it, some of you may uh, don't, um, what is called the Microsoft Tenant Restriction. So the Tenant Restriction is a security feature that is uh, from Microsoft. Basically, it allows you to prevent your uh, people in your company uh, to authenticate on tenants that uh, you don't trust. So what you do is when you perform uh, HTTP authentication on a tenant, you can add specific HTTP headers uh, in the authentication request. Uh, the HTTP headers will be a white list of tenants that you trust, and a Microsoft server is in charge of performing the verification. So in practice, uh, how do you use it? Um, it's embedded in many uh, proxy software, like uh, Zscaler, Forcepoint, Broadcom, etc. Uh, what it does is you perform SSL interception on outgoing requests to Microsoft websites, and then you inject the HTTP header uh, for the tenant that you trust in the outgoing request, and everything is safe again. Thank you. Hello everyone. If anyone gets that reference, please, please, please tell me. So I'm going to be talking about building, well, how I built my own Redis honeypot. So, whoops. So a month ago, I read this article by Aquasex Nautilus team about the head crab malware, and I thought it was really cool. So I, bu I built a honeypot to try and get similar samples. So what is Redis? Even though most of you probably know, it's an in-memory database, which is designed to be totally insecure if exposed to the outside world. And that's, Antares is the creator of Redis. Uh, how does it work? It's basically a dictionary server. Like you can get keys and set keys, it's, it's pretty simple. How do you pwn a Redis server? Well, you can either use like a Lua vulnerability or CVE. You can use the config to set well, the contents of a file, so like an SSH key or a web shell. Or you can use the slave of and module load method how does that work? Well, an attacker tells your Redis server that it's a slave to his malicious Redis server. So your server clones the malicious server's database, which isn't a database, it's in fact a backdoor, so a shared library, which your server then loads, and you get code execution. So how does my proxy, well, how does my honeypot work? It's a proxy that logs just everything, and if it sees attack patterns, so the module load, for example, it goes and gets the binary and saves it somewhere. And all the, well, non-malicious traffic is sent to a, an actual Redis server, and well, the malicious one is just returned with a, with a fake response. So what results did I get? Uh, well, I set it up in prod yesterday at 3 a.m., so I didn't get much. But that's not actually true, whoops. That's not actually true, because when I woke up this morning, I saw a lot of stuff. So, whoops, here are the IOCs. So all of those are linked to already known campaigns, so the Kiss the Dog and Watchdog. Yeah, that's gonna be a lot of, lot of malware to analyze. That's gonna be fun. So yeah, see you next year, if some of the malware I find is interesting. <laughs>
thing. So hi everyone, uh, I'm Xanax from the La Postiante, and today we'll talk about the Houdini malware family, and more specifically about uh, automation and of extraction and the C2 polling. So a bit of history, Houdini is a VBS-based rat which started uh, 10 years ago, and uh, it's still active nowadays, yes. So there is a variance uh, like WSH rat and others, so basically, they uh, all work the same. So you have an infinite loop that requests the C2, and then you have a switch case to execute the correct orders. So to automate things, first we need to download samples, for example, uh, using uh, VirusTotal live hunt based on your rules, and uh, others well-known uh, DBs like TrueAge or Malware Bazaar. And for the extraction parts, we will use a Windows VM that contains uh, HTTP, HTTP proxy in it. So when the samples request the CDU, we extract the user agent from the request. And uh, the user agent is a, a fingerprint of the victim's computers. So here we have a list of uh, C2 URLs and uh, user agents. So now we, we can create fake bots uh, to gather recent orders from the C2 in order to, to uh, get many payloads. So to do that, we create a modular Python application. Each blue square represents a Python class that uh, implements functions to respond to the C2's orders. And uh, we also have a father sons relationships. So for example, the WSH rate V2 erits from the WSH rate V1. And uh, there is examples of payloads and samples. So as a result, we have uh, almost 1,000 bots, lots of orders. And sometimes when we open C2 URLs in our browser, we find open directories that contains lots of text files, for share files and other things. Uh, the most useful orders are execute ones. They mainly contain other rats, like uh, nanocore, bitrat, ngrat, remcos, and sometimes more advanced, advanced payloads, like uh, cobalt strike. Thank you, everyone. Everybody, uh, before we start, quick show of hands, who's using streaming services? Quite a few. Who's annoyed that some regions have more content than other regions? <laughs> Many people. Who knows about geo blocking through uh, VPN providers? Many people. But who knows how they do that? Hopefully no hands. Great. So this is my talk, Stranger VPNs. It's a, <laughs> it's a paper uh, I wrote recently with my colleagues, and this is a very short lightning version of that. So we bought some VPN services for different regions and we try to see um, how exactly they do geo blocking. It's not that easy because connections to Netflix or Disney Plus, whatever, they get terminated at a TLS proxy. So your TCP connection stops, but the TLS stream keeps on going through. That means you can't use ping or traceroute to find out any more information of that blob where the data goes through. But we found a way to extract data and these are the results. It's a big graph of many uh, samples. Let's take a closer look. For example, for Surfshark, we have two subgraphs. The top graph shows how many unique IPs we encountered, basically roughly 2,500. And the bottom graph shows how many different uh, autonomous systems we found. Uh, in this case, uh, only one color or two on the right, meaning we only have a few a ASNs. This is a different provider, uh, private VPN. They only use a few IP addresses and only a few ASNs as well. This is pretty boring, basically, right? Um, I should mention that these ASNs, they are sometimes fake companies that set up, so that's another doozy. In any case, what about this? We see many different ASNs, and I think most of us will recognize what this means. Of course, it's residential proxies. So here we see CyberGhost in Germany making use of many uh, different ASNs or ExpressVPN. Also interesting to see is the pattern. For example, in Japan, they use the orange single ASN for an amount of time, then they skip to many different ASNs, and then get back to one again. We don't know why they do that. It seems to be economically feasible like this. 
So we have two things basically. We have the fake providers and the residential proxies. We collected data for eight uh, months roughly and we found uh, 215,000 IPv4s and uh, roughly two million uh, unique IPv6s. All numbers are unique and more than 2,000 different ASNs. Some big providers from different regions are of course in there. Um, and yeah, talk to me if you want to know, or sorry, if you know where these residential proxies come from, because we don't know. Uh, if you have more questions about the paper or just want to talk in general. The full paper can be downloaded uh, through this QR link. Um, yeah, questions via email or in person, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Jean-Baptiste, I come from Brest and I'm here to, well, mainly targeting French speaking people because uh, it is uh, mainly a French speaking conference. Uh, it will be next November, um, so it's quite easy to get to, you just, when you walk from here, you just go west till you arrive at sea, okay? Um, so yeah, no, um, joke uh, aside, uh, last year we had 14 speakers, uh, 11 talks, uh, three workshops and one attack defense CTF. Um, we are a bit late, uh, no, not late, but well, the CFP and everything isn't open yet. Um, it's around 400 attendees and well, it's in a nice city, well, I live there, so, so it's of course, nice. Um, here are a few speakers from the previous editions. You may know some of them. Some of them, in fact, are here. Um, and so, well, if you're interested, uh, either because you want to attend, or maybe because you want to sponsor, or because you want to send uh, a talk, uh, well, contact us or contact me. I'll be there till uh, tomorrow evening, so we can chat about it. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Fred, so I'm part of the organizing committee and also security researcher at Datalog. So I will try to sum up a presentation my colleagues did a few weeks ago in uh, three minutes. So <clears throat> it's about a uh, malicious software package, so mostly based on uh, PyPy and NPM. So quick definition, what's malicious uh, software package attack chain? So initial vector, code execution trigger, code execution mechanism, and the final objective. So what we would like to detect, uh, so at first we want to detect, for example, some typo squatting directly available on, uh, on PyPy, uh, some project description, so most of the time they can be empty. Uh, we also want to detect what's directly available in the source code, so once, once you, you do a pip install, for example, but also some uh, writing of files, then executing it. <coughs> And finally, for example, stealing uh, cookies and so on. Uh, so in order to do that, we released uh, recently GuardDog. So it's a fully open source and self-contained uh, software. Uh, it supports PyPy and NPM. And we ingest uh, source code and package metadata. <coughs> so about metadata heuristics, uh, it's written in Python and we just ingest uh, all the PyPy feeds and we get uh, some information about uh, the packages uh, themselves. <coughs> Regarding source code analysis, uh, we are using SEMGREP, which is an open source tactic code analysis tool, and uh, it's also directly embedded in GuardDog. So here we have uh, some, an example of uh, SEMGREP rules to uh, detect malicious package. Um, so we are also continuously scanning PyPy. So just by using the PyPy feeds, for example, to get the metadata. Uh, so you get all the information here. And we deployed it uh, directly in uh, AWS with some Lambda function, SQSQ, and so on. And uh, uh, getting all the samples directly in, pack in uh, S3 buckets. Uh, some statistics about uh, the running infrastructure. So, so far we scanned uh, five, uh, 
no, 51 K packages and it took uh, around 12 seconds to scan. Uh, malicious package uh, in the wild, so some statistics. So as you can see, we have uh, on a daily basis some uh, malicious packages uh, on, uh, yeah, by scanning uh, like uh, uh, three key uh, packages per day. <coughs> uh, finally, we have also opened the data set, so you can directly have access to it if you want. Uh, so far, we have uh, around 1,000 packages. Uh, you can get it because they are uh, most of the time uh, deleted directly from the PyPy. And finally, it's open source, so if you want to contribute, uh, feel free to contact us. And that's it, and the full the <laughs> documentation here. Thanks. Hi, everyone. So um, I'm here to talk about the breadcrumbs that can be found in uh, ransomware negotiations. I'm basically uh, a ransomware negotiations collector. I've had copies of more than 150 uh, negotiations involving groups like Rival, Darkseid, Avedon, Renzi, Avos, Hive, Black Matter, Black Basta. It's definitely a privileged point of view as negotiations are often dealt with away from the RR team. Uh, it, gets, uh, it helps getting access to decryptors, payment addresses, and some more insight into the group, into the attackers that are involved. Um, as an example, um, I would just mention that, well, wait a second, uh, we'd just like to, to, uh, to mention uh, a few decryptors that got found like that. Uh, there used to be one for dark side that led to uh, building a more generic uh, decryptor. Uh, based on a vulnerability or a flow that was found in the encryption routine for the um, Linux ASXi version variant of, of DarkSide. Um, the case was the same for Hive, and there's been many more cases like that. Um, one of the uh, things that we get to know is uh, basically show me the money and following the activity. It starts with one actually observed uh, ransom payment. You have one here on the left. Uh, <coughs> And then you start from there and you try to find a consolidation node. Um, as you see there on the right, on the top, um, top right, you've got a consolidation node. This is a Conti case. Uh, this node uh, was actually mentioned uh, in the ProDraft uh, report on Conti last November, but it had already been found before, not publicly mentioned. Um, but basically, since you have a consolidation node like that, you start looking back, looking back in the past and trying to assess past activity. You can also try to put a marker on it and wait just to see what comes in. And uh, each time you uh, kind of get to better know about the activity of the ransomware actor. Um, <clears throat> that's where you follow up on uh, ongoing activity. Here on the top right, you will see a Bitcoin address which actually leads to the REN exchange uh, Bitcoin reserve. So that's still the Conti. Uh, they've been doing that kind of cleanup uh, by the end of May last year. Uh, they tell us somehow a thing about how they work as well. Here you have an, an example also of Conti. This script, this way of starting the conversation was seen for 17 negotiations, including the ones for Exagreed, for uh, the Irish S, uh, H, H, SE. Uh, we've seen some variations as well elsewhere. Uh, this one was slightly different. We've seen it for eight negotiations. It helps us uh, confirm that the group was organized in subdivisions, in subgroups that were all on, our, on their own and managing negotiations on themselves. And quickly, very much to finish, um, I suspect someone here to have moved from Revil to Conti. If you see someone encrypting a proof pack at 123, 123, please reach out to me, tell me the group. I'm curious.
Hello everyone, I'm uh, Frédéric Guillo. I'm a co-founder and scientist lead of uh, Gleams, a uh, young French startup uh, that works on uh, malware uh, detection and deep analysis. Uh, I didn't initially uh, plan on doing this talk, but uh, Daniel uh, this morning basically explicitly, explicitly asked for that when he mentioned if we knew if Logbit, uh, why Logbit and Conti were related by regarding their code. Fortunately, a few weeks ago, uh, our CTI teams worked on Logbit Green samples, uh, the, the hashes are here, and I think that you can find them on Malware Bazaar. And then we submitted to uh, our platform, uh, and when we look at uh, malware detection uh, th with our interviruses, uh, we see that one of them uh, flagged the malware as Bazaar Loader. We went deeper and uh, used what we, what we call the, our deep engine. It's our internal, uh, internal uh, deep learning technology that does malware detection uh, and correlation th thanks to code uh, analysis. I won't go into details here, but uh, I'm be very happy to dis discuss this uh, with you uh, this evening, of course. And as we can see, we can here identify a few groups, Logbit, County, Trickbot, and Bazaar Loader that have links uh, with our sample. So first, a look at uh, Logbit. We have some malicious code that have been identified, and you can see at the bottom, what we call the, the heat map, where we show uh, where the malicious code are located uh, within uh, the address space uh, of the binary. If we look at Conti, we can see that the similarities are a bit, uh, a bit uh, fainter. Uh, it's because, uh, as was mentioned this morning, uh, Logbit used the leaked code from Conti, but they changed it, they updated it, they added their own, uh, their own code. And if we go further, we see that there are links uh, with TrickBot as well, which is logical because TrickBot and Conti are working together and sharing their code. And uh, last but not least, we are seeing here Bazaar Loader, which has even less similarities. And uh, it's uh, because uh, basically Bazaar Loader also used the leaked code from Conti. So uh, what we can get from here is some kind of transitivity between Logbit, Conti, and Bazaar Loader, uh, because uh, both Logbit and Bazaar Loader used the code uh, leaked from Conti. I wanted to do uh, this, uh, this demo yesterday, but uh, I had the chance to, uh, to discover uh, that uh, the signature from Clamavi was updating within that time, and now uh, Clamavi uh, correctly uh, identifies the file uh, as a logbit. Thank you very much. Uh, feel free to, uh, to meet me uh, this evening if you want to go more into detail uh, with uh, in especially uh, the algorithm that we use. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I can present it in three, min in three minutes, the algorithm itself, but not in 14 seconds, sorry. Thank you. Okay, please, please all get closer. Okay. Um, so I, I gathered with the, the jury uh, to decide who, uh, who did the best talk. Um, and uh, I, I dis well, we decided, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Felix, who did a, a good demo that worked, uh, <laughs> deserves the prize. And really, thank you to all of you. It was uh, great uh, listening to those talks. I, I'm sure everybody was happy to uh, all, all those uh, exchanges, uh, free offers for uh, exchange of information, exchange of tools, etc. So it's uh, really great. Thank you so much. <laughs>